we've been doing them by Zoom. And it's been lovely. We've been learning so much about what's been going on um, just right at Pratt, right going on at Pratt. And we, you don't have to wait for the research open house um, to be put online to find out um, all the amazing things that are going on. Um, this is good. This is our last research uh, talk of the uh, of the semester and of the of the academic year. Um, but this really has been so much fun that we will continue this um, for years to come. Uh, maybe, who knows, sometime in the future, it can be hybrid and some of us will be online and some of us won't be. But anyway, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, and we'll just go, the, go with that. Anyway, um, now the force behind this, uh, these uh, talks and the organization of these talks is, uh, uh, is my colleague, Rachel Asher. But um, let me just, uh, yay, Rachel. Um, let me just say that um, as uh, Associate Provost for Research and Strategic Partnerships, um, the best part of my job um, is actually learning about all the research that people do. And so I thank all of you for being here. I thank the speakers for today and our speakers that we've had. And just um, so you all know, we'd like to record these um, uh, this talk so that we can put our past talks up online so other people can be seeing what, uh, what we see. Um, and so if you, uh, if you don't want to be online um, or on, in, on video, uh, you can certainly turn off your screen if, if you feel comfortable, okay? Um, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Rachel and Rachel will get us started, Rachel. Sure. So welcome everyone to our final and very exciting talk of the uh, spring semester. Um, so happy to have you all here. Um, today we're going to be hearing from Daniel Bergman and Elena Altuntas. Um, Elena is a fourth year PhD candidate in art education with a minor in curriculum and instruction at Penn State University, and she's a Bunton Waller Award recipient. Mm -hmm. She currently serves as co-president of the Graduate Art Education Association and as a graduate teaching assistant on Art 20, Introduction to Drawing. Her dissertation focuses on a sound curriculum called Tuning in New York City for Art Education, a teaching resource focusing on experiencing, creating, and composing soundscapes of environments. Daniel Bergman is our director of the K-12 Center for Art and Design Education and Community Engagement. Prior to coming to Pratt, he has had a career as a K-12 arts educator and administrator in schools, nonprofits, and museums. He has a BA in visual art and intellectual history from Wesleyan, an MFA in painting and sculpture from SVA, and an MS Ed in educational leadership from the University of Pennsylvania. Today, we'll hear about a collaborative research project between Aleda and the K-12 Center to assess the impact of curricula that invite New York City youth to express and explore their identity language and sociocultural backgrounds using the methods of listening, producing, and recording the sounds of their own choice of environments. Through this research, they aim to meaningfully contribute to art education by exploring the meaning of silence, noise, and rhythm from environmental sounds. So we'll start with their presentation and then follow it with a conversation. So um, get your questions ready or you can feel free to put them in the chat. Um, over to you two. Well, Rachel, thank you for that incredible introduction. Um, you kind of stole our thunder from the first slide. Um, but uh, just so folks know the, the names and the voices, uh, I, I am Daniel Bergman, the director of the, the Center for Art and Design Education Community Engagement K-12 here at Pratt. And I'm presenting today, of course, with... Elida Altentosh. Um, so I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in art education with a minor in curriculum and instruction at Pennsylvania State University. Um, so today, Daniel and I will be speaking about the, um, about the following topics um, to show our collaborative approach between Penn State and Pratt Institute Center K-12. Um, so Daniel will be giving you an overview of the Center K-12 program. Uh, and I will be describing the lessons of the sound curriculum I created, um, the creation processes and display examples of student works uh, and discuss further implications. Um, so Daniel. So um, for those of you who perhaps aren't fully aware of everything that the Center K-12 does, I thought I'd take this opportunity just to lay out a little bit of what we do. Um, and beginning with our mission, 
the, the mission of the Center K-12 is to increase access to instruction in art and design uh, for young people by leveraging the resources and expertise of the Institute to support school-aged children, citywide public schools, and youth-serving organizations. Uh, the Center brings together art, design, and architecture to create meaningful exchanges between faculty and students and schools and community-based organizations. So um, it's all a very fancy way of saying at some level, I'm, I'm very excited to be at Pratt at this time where it feels like the center is in some ways very much at that vanguard of, uh, of Pratt's strategic pillar to get beyond the gates. Um, though the center is only six years old, um, when founded six years ago, it really was with that intention of bridging the connection between Pratt and the surrounding community. So um, it's a very exciting moment to be here at Pratt and, and to be that place that, that seeks to move beyond the gate. We'll go to the next slide. Um, the center right now really runs six core programs. I'll just mention them. I won't go into depth on all of them, but we have our Saturday Art School. We have the DICE program, which stands for Design Initiative for Community Empowerment. We run our Pratt Young Scholars program, our Summer Scholars program, uh, the Tom Maines Young Architects Program, and of some import, especially for this talk today, our faculty research fellowships. Uh, and I wanna begin by just mentioning our Saturday Art School um, only because of its history. Uh, it dates back, as you can see, to the uh, 1800s, 1897, is it one date we believe the Saturday Art School can be traced to. It offers classes for students from ages five to 18, and for serious artists and, and just curious beginners. And it really is emblematic of Pratt's enduring and ongoing commitment to serving the community around Pratt. So if Saturday Art School dates to 1897, we know it's only part of the, the outreach that has been part of Pratt um, really since within a decade of its founding in the 1850s. Um, our Pratt Young Scholars Program has become maybe our, our uh, most renowned program. It serves um, low-income students. It's a full scholarship program. We bring in 20 students each year. They apply as high school freshmen. They begin the program as sophomores. And during their sophomore, junior, and senior years of high school, they receive uh, programming through Saturday Art School. They take courses through our DICE program. They're enrolled in courses in our Summer Scholars program. In addition to all of the art and design classroom time they have, they get additional support through our college preparation process where they have opportunities not only to learn about what kinds of colleges there are out there, there are workshops for parents about paying for college, about what colleges. Most of our Pratt Young Scholars are first generation uh, college going students. They get SAT prep, there are workshops on filling out FAFSA forms, they get uh, help putting together portfolios. It's a really wonderful wraparound program. Um, and I'm thrilled to report that in fact, as of today, we have our final college uh, acceptances in. And of the 17 graduating Pratt Young Scholars, 16 were admitted to Pratt. Of those 16 admitted to Pratt, eight will be attending Pratt. All 17 graduating scholars were accepted at four-year colleges and universities, um, and all of them will be attending four-year programs, um, with the exception of one student who is going to uh, begin at a community college in a two-year program. So 16 of 17 into four-year colleges, um, eight of them coming to Pratt. We're very proud. Oh, and of the ones not coming to Pratt, I do have to brag, one of them is going to Columbia on a full ride scholarship and the other is going to Tufts to join the School of Museum Fine Art dual degree program. So um, we're very proud of our scholars. We're very proud of the Pratt faculty um, who have supported them. Um, it's been really exciting to see this program flourish. And now we'll move on to the next. Um, and I also wanna talk for a moment about our faculty fellowships because uh, although the center ostensibly runs programming, uh, we are also part of Pratt's ongoing research initiatives. Um, every year, there are uh, a number of grants that we're, we're able to give to faculty uh, who want to engage in research, um, research that extends the center's mission, 
makes a contribution to the advancement uh, of research related to children and youth, particularly in art and design related fields. Um, they, the fellowships are a $3,000 stipend, which also comes with an additional, additional funds for a paid research assistant. Um, and uh, we ask that the research at the very least result in some kind of a, a poster that is published and, and we make public so that the findings can be seen by the Pratt community. Um, with good fortune, we'll have opportunities for folks to present at forums like this as well. Um, and the applications actually just closed for this year yesterday, but if anyone feels truly inspired by this um, and feels like, gosh, there's really something that they would love to explore, uh, if applications come in in the next couple of days, I'm not gonna kick you out the door. Um, so it was because of this research that we do, um, I was really excited when uh, actually via Aileen, um, I was forwarded an email from Elida. Um, because the one thing that Rachel didn't mention in her introduction to Elida is that Elida is also a Pratt alumna herself, having earned a master's in art and design education um, here at Pratt. So as she was pursuing her PhD program and had reached a point where she wanted to be able to test the curricula that she developed, she was looking for a partner. And in Good fortune, she'd reached out to Pratt via Aileen, who forwarded the email to me. And as soon as I saw it, and as soon as I spoke to Elida, I thought, goodness gracious, this is an opportunity just too rich to pass up, to have an opportunity to have a genuine bit of research done, a new kind of curricula explored, and curricula that kind of tickled my fancy in a particular way. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, what Elida proposed was exploring the potential of sound art. Mm -hmm. And what I loved was the distinction, of course, between sound art and music. We all know about music, we all know about composers, but having been in my entire career in K-12, I don't know anybody who's ever explored the possibility of making sound art with young people. And it tickled my fancy in some ways because in my own background, I'll tell you the truth, my family make fun of me. They, they call me the garbage disposal because of all the various random and stray bits and pieces that float around in my head. And among them are things like Harry Bert Bertoia's Sonambulant Sculptures, um, one of which is pictured on the left, which somehow I've been aware of them since my teenage years and always intrigued by them. And what's fascinating about them is they generate and make sound, not incidentally, that is just because if you happen to bump into one of them, it makes sound, but they are supposed to make sound. It is part of their very being. Um, and if any of you had been in New York in the 80s, this is actually an image of Christian uh, Marclay's piece, Tape Fall, as it was installed in Houston, but it was installed at one time in the Whitney. That's where I first saw it. It was one of my favorite pieces. Uh, it was installed, if you remember the, the Breuer building in the stairwell, you could go to the fourth floor and you could look down behind the stairs so what he had done is he installed this reel-to-reel -reel tape, top of the fourth floor, with only the play reel, no uptake reel. So trickling down through the stairwell was this reel-to-reel -reel tape playing the sound of dripping water. To me, just a brilliant piece. And for those of you who have been in and around, in and around Times Square since the 70s, you might have come across pioneering piece by Max Newhouse, his Times Square sound installation. So these things have lived in my mind um, as just stuff that I, I love and I'm fascinated by. And so when Elida came by with the, the thought of maybe we could explore making sound art with youth, I thought, well, this is too great an opportunity to pass up. And, and so it was with open arms, we, we invited her in, we recruited a group of youth and I'll allow Elida to tell you what she found and what she did and, and share the exciting news of what they created. Great, thank you, Daniel. So, and it's been also uh, my pleasure to have the opportunity to do this work with Pratt. And, and I'm so grateful that um, I was pro provided a platform to make this happen. So um, I will, continue actually where Daniel has left us um, in terms of uh, understanding what sound art is and looking at sound art. And I wanted to mention um, the year 1913 was the birth year to Luigi Rosolo's manifesto proclaiming a new art called sound art. 
um, the art of noise. The birth of sound art included sound installations, sound recordings, sound environments, sound samplings, and industrial noise. So tuning in dot NYC, tuning in art education is also inspired from the practices of sound art. It is a teaching and learning resource focusing on experiencing, creating, and composing soundscapes of environments. Um, so as part of the dissertation project I, uh, I've been working on, I designed a website. And in this website, I created modules of a sound curriculum, online resources, software tools, interactive surveys to collect student data, links to student artists and their works, videos, articles, and other instructions for students to help them create their sound compositions. During the teaching process of the sound curriculum, I thought, observed, participated, interviewed, and conversed with students. In the next slide, we're looking at the uh, module page of the uh, online curriculum. Um, for my dissertation project, um, I created this curriculum to research the ways in which students develop and create sonic knowledge including meaning making, perceptual awareness, and sound art creation. The virtual after-school curriculum I designed for Pratt's programs um, consisted of 10 weekly, two-hour sound-based art classes in which students participated in listening activities and described their meanings of sounds of their surroundings. The 10 high school students listened, recorded, collected, and made sounds of their surroundings and produced soundscapes rather than music. Through this research, I aimed to contribute to art education by exploring how students listen, understand, and give meanings to the sounds of their places and looked at how they created these sound compositions. Um, moving forward, the first unit of the sound cur curriculum focused on this idea of listening. And the unit consisted of four uh, lessons. In this unit, students shared their ideas of what they think a place is. They identified a place that they think they spend most of their time. For example, students participated uh, to a listening activity called sound game. They listened to a collection of sounds and described the sounds they heard. And they gave their own personal meanings to the sounds that they listen to. Uh, so right now I'm going to change the page that I'm sharing and I'm going to just ask you to be momentarily patient with me and I'm hoping that you're seeing a new page at the moment. And I wanna play the sound that I also played to students. And uh, this was a very critical moment for them as well to um, approach to the idea of listening um, through a virtual platform. So I'd like to also hear from you um, later on when we can share, um, when the sharing time comes. So hopefully you will be able to hear this.
So I'm going to pause it here. Um, I'm hoping that was giving an idea of what the listening, the, the first listening activity looked like. Following the listening practice, um, so I had follow-up questions, and this was my way of informing the teaching practices. And I initiated many questions to students, so I could get a better sense of what they're listening and understanding the sounds of their uh, environment looks like. So they did later on share what sounds they heard, what type of sounds they were able to identify and what sounds they were able to hear. Uh, and they all shared very interesting um, ideas about what they thought of the sounds they heard from this uh, recording. Um, I will show examples regarding to this later on but I'd like to uh, go back to my slides and continue with the other modules. Uh, moving forward to the second unit. Um, so students further explored ways of creating soundscapes. This time uh, they, all right, my apologies. This time uh, they explored a uh, music production technique called sampling sounds. Uh, they identified sound marks of their own places and created their own sound orchestra inspired by Luigi Russolo's Futurist Orchestra. Um, students also explored other ways of recording formats. Um, as you see here, uh, they also looked at conversations, talks, and their own voices uh, as a way to use in their compositions. So here, I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. Um, I'm going back to this page. Um, here, for example, the student Talene. Uh, by the way, I have all the permissions, so I'm using uh, our students' first names. Uh, he talked about the sounds of cooking in his apartment. And um, so one of the sound marks that uh, one of the sounds that he listed in his sound marks list was um, it was related to cooking, but I don't want to say what it was. So I want to play it to you and maybe you would enjoy this idea of guessing what that sound was. Um, it's, well, it kind of gives you the clue what it is, but maybe you could guess what type of vegetable it is. <laughs> So it goes on and on. But um, so this was part of the earlier uh, recording practices we worked on. Um, I, I am going to actually go ahead and play the final piece to show you what the Futures Orchestra actually looked like and what it was about. Um, and combining this idea of um, using sampling and their soundscape composition sounded, didn't look like, but sounded like this. And this was his final piece. Thank you. 
So Talin talked about this piece as part of the cacophony of sounds in his apartment. Uh, he shared more and more about the piece that again, um, I will get to those uh, pieces later. Um, now I'm going back to my slide again, and I'm gonna move forward with another example, just to show you how the um, students' creations differed from each other. Um, that was uh, Danielle's piece. She, um, I have them, I have those right here. Um, so she did describe the sounds that she created also in an artist statement, um, but she chose to use the conversations and the talks and the voices in her apartment as part of her sound album that uh, she created at the end of the, the classes. Uh, so for example, um, her sound recording is... They'll come in and just expect you to just fix everything and not even tell you what it is they want you to fix. And it's just bizarre. You're like, how can I help you? They're like, yeah, I need you to fix this. And you're like, fix what? And this is like, you have to pull teeth to figure out what they're referring to because they're thinking it in their head and not realizing you have to communicate what your issue is for me to assist you. Are humans becoming machines or are machines becoming humans? Aida Towers is partnering with nearby police and neighborhood health centers. Under these policies, they express concerns about the lack of vaccine distribution in the area compared to other neighborhoods. So, Danielle uh, described the sounds that she recorded in her artist statement here, and I'd like to read it. The first track that you heard. Uh, she describes it, the first track, Strange, includes a line from a conversation with my mom. I wanted to include her because she's the first thing I think of when the word home comes to my mind. She's loving, funny, and insightful. I would never be where I am today without her sacrifices. I also featured some of the regular sounds I hear around my house, like my creaky bedroom door and the water running from the bathroom. Can't go a day without hearing those. Um, so, Moving forward from the examples to the final unit, uh, I'd like to share a couple other examples. Um, so the, in the final unit of the sound curriculum, students further explored ways of creating soundscapes. This time they explored rhythm, uh, machine sounds, and identified what sounds are human or non-human. Finally, students put all the sound pieces they recorded together in a sound album on SoundCloud. Um, we are looking at an image um, of, uh, of a photograph a student took. Um, this picture represents her sound album and her sound album was completely based on her, based on the street in front of her house. And she identified, she chose the street as her place, as her unique place, where she said that she spends most of her time on the street. And the recordings she created was completely based on the street, based on the sounds of the street. And as we were working on these projects, um, I would ask students to go record the sounds of their environment. So we would take 30 minutes to do it. So she would walk down and step outside of her apartment and try to get the sounds that she was willing to, in order to create her sound piece. So her examples are um, here. Um, I'm going to play that one right now. <laughs>
Um, so what I want to mention here, actually, right after listening to Mia's creations, she was really passionate about uh, her bicycle and having her bicycle on the street with her and going on uh, biking tours. And I want to read her statement. Um, so this album represents the sounds of the place I choose, the street in front of my house. In my first audio, I want it to sound I want it to sound like someone walking down my block. I included the sound of a door closing, a car driving bar, by, footsteps and dogs barking, all stuff I hear often and most resonate with this place. In my second audio, I wanted the listener to feel like they were driving down the street. In this one, I included dogs barking, cars and bikes driving past, birds chirping, people talking, and throughout the song, Shades of Blue by Lana Del Rey. And I want to just add a note here, this was part of the sampling technique where they explored the idea of rhythm and looping, choosing a section from their favorite music or favorite songs. Um, so in order to make them seem that the car was playing music, she used that part um, in her piece. Finally, in my last audio piece, I recorded the rain and my footsteps then put them together to give the illusion that I was walking down um, my block in the rain. Altogether, the environment I choose, the street I live on, has lots of good memories for me, so I try to show this place by my tracks of what it would sound like to be there. Um, so I'm going back to my slides, and hopefully now uh, the sections about the methodology of my dissertation and the theoretical framework and my research questions will uh, probably clarify a lot of things why I have been uh, recording these sounds and having students work on sound pieces. So um, my methodology is arts-based and, and the theoretically um, grounded in Murray Schaefer's tuning in theory. And I will speak about these further now. Um, throughout my teaching of the sound curriculum, I experimented with listening, recording, and producing methods, um, arts-based forms, as in other words, to gain knowledge about the sounds of daily lives of the students. Through these arts-based approaches, I studied students' listening experiences and their surroundings analyzed students' meanings and definitions of sounds from their places, and engaged in students' listening, recording, and producing practices. But more importantly, because arts-based inquiry can help explore multiple new and diverse ways of understanding and living the world, I embrace the potential of sound art to inform my teaching methodologies. In this way, sound art form speaks as methods of listening, recording, and producing, and facilitate as sound art curriculum. For instance, um, this sound art curriculum focused on sound methods as a form of art, which provided a platform for youth as we listen to the pieces to establish a sense of self-expression and an opportunity to develop their artistic skills while learning from their homes. By working with artistic sound art disciplines, um, such as listening, recording, and producing, students communicated outcomes in ways that rely on sound as an epistemology of knowing about their places and surroundings. And in order to discuss about this uh, epistemology of knowing, other ways of knowing about the world around us, I theoretically grounded my uh, research methodology in Murray Schaefer's theory of listening tuning in. And tuning in is really about an individual's own way of understanding and giving meanings to the sounds of their environments. And moving forward, my research questions for this project, one I asked, how does a sound curriculum and pedagogy facilitate an understanding of sound as an epistemology of knowing? And the second one looked at the practice and the making part of the work. How do students describe the meanings of sound and um, through the practices of listening to their surroundings? And the final question 
with the final question, I make the argument whether the sound curriculum function as an art curriculum. Um, so the findings, um, discussing about the findings. So this, this part of the work um, does give us new knowledge for both research, theory, and practice. Uh, because students brought new knowledge to the study of sound art and sound installation by showing one how they listen to how they understand and three how they give meanings to the sounds of their environments and here i wanted to uh, talk about valentino's piece um, because the way he gave meaning to his place and his place was a basketball court um, i think explains how this transformation of new knowledge happens really well. Um, so quickly, I will shift my screen again and I'm just gonna shift to his page. So before I play his sounds, I this time wanna um, read the statement that he wrote. He wrote, a feel of desperation in the morning basketball practice. It was sunny outdoors in public. Chaotic mixtures of common sounds from people, engines, birds, and nature are normally heard. Two friends are meeting up at the court to have a reunion game. Suddenly, loud dripping noises started to form on the ground. Heavy ra rains entered the game, causing disruptions. A day of basketball practice to prepare for an up coming big game. The birds were chirping, a signal for morning. The practice happened outdoors, portraying the fierce of intense dribbles, footsteps, and roughness of metal backboards. All the players' actions and efforts create an energetic presence. We live in a world of machinery. Everything around us can be a machine. We use it in our daily lives, develop it, or get inspired by it. It made what we want to do most of the time possible machine has made great impacts in our lives. So um, Valentino was one of the students. He, because I also gave them the option to choose a place that they don't have access to. And we looked at ideas of collecting sounds and finding sounds uh, using the internet and other ways that technology supported us so that they can create soundscapes based on their favorite places. So from the beginning, this basketball court was his favorite place, but he wasn't able to spend as much as time there because of the pandemic. Um, but this was his creation. So he created the sounds of the um, basketball court, as you will just hear them now. I'm going to play them. I think I mistakenly skipped the first sound. to um, stop there because I just wanted to show you that one um, example, final example. And, um, but moving forward, um, I wanted to just read you some of the other uh, reflections and conversations that I gathered as data um, when I was interviewing students and during the teaching and learning processes as well. So for example, student Danielle in uh, one of those activities where they created the list of sound sounds of the of their places, she identified the sounds of her environment as loud, chatter, talk, gospel sounds, and sounds of her mom. 
Next, she described these sounds as different energies in her surroundings, relaxing, comforting, and taking part in. And we did listen to one of the pieces that she uh, recorded earlier. And um, so we also looked at the idea of tangible sound art making as well by exploring a variety of art materials from, um, from wire to clay, these DC mortars that has movement and it works with batteries and from ping pong balls to rubber bands. And um, so students learned to use sound as a new medium of art making as well. And, um, but more importantly, uh, when we look at the methods of arts-based approaches, um, so arts-based approaches don't only involve the 3D tangible sound art making, but it also involves music, soundscape composition, context-based art, sound theories, and practices. So the way that um, this happens is, uh, for example, when students interpreted their soundscape compositions with the juxtaposition of the following three sound principles from the 13 criteria of sound art. And this is very similar how visual arts work in many cases. But the criteria that um, we looked at here involved concept, narrativity, and the production of sound. So this is how I amplify new knowledge from the ways in which students listen, record, and produce the soundscape of their places, thinking with the sound theories of tuning in and the acoustomology of place. Um, and I described the students' creations of soundscapes based on how they listen, understand, and gave meanings. Um, and moving forward, I also wanted to just uh, show this just uh, also, I, I wanted to give my thanks to Pratt in terms of how they were so helpful um, in the process of um, delivering these items to students, each of the students, to each of their places, basically, wherever they lived. And um, so the process for me, it worked, it started very uh, small here. I first started to think about materials and materiality, what kind of items like I, I can collect in terms of thinking about sound art and making and uh, gathered these paper bags and um, made sure each student gets pieces <laughs> in a very organized way and uh, from think, thinking from a pencil to uh, even a notebook. And then I did bring these packages to Pratt and then, but because of the pandemic, or like I'm, I want to explain this process because I think it's really important. And so, because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to go past the door. But um, they, Pratt staff, met me outside, and then they took these bags. And then I asked them, and if they could send me pictures of their process of putting these pieces in a box and shipping them, and they did. It was really. Um, wonderful to work with Pratt staff. And so these were the boxes, they placed them in these boxes and then, then they were shipped. And then I created this little manifesto um, in terms of, it just shows the inventory of what the students will have. Uh, so thank, I just wanna say thank you for also making this happen. Um, yeah, so I wanted to uh, finish the um, slides with um, basically just talking about how students um, gained this idea of becoming more aware of the sounds of their surroundings and how they created a relation between themselves and their places. And um, I will stop here. Um, and then I kind of want to leave some of the feedbacks that I received from students here. Um, they did mention that it, the, the process of learning and doing this felt good. Uh, one of them said, I know that obviously with the quarantine uh, of all this stuff, 
Um, it would have been nice to be able to get together in person, but being able to go to our own respective worlds and just record sounds was a really valuable experience. Thank you. And um, one student said that he started, uh, she started looking at the sounds in a different way, like even with writing down notes about mundane things or noises. Uh, she talked about how she became more aware now of the sounds in her apartment that she would notice things that she wouldn't notice before. Um, and then another one here from Valentino, he talked about how the idea of sound and sound art has changed for him. And now that he considers sound in a different way, he says that he's becoming more aware of, her, of his surroundings and um, these sounds again that he wouldn't notice before becomes more um, evident in his environment. Um, Lida? Yeah, so I'm gonna stop. Thank you for, for that remarkably rich uh, and textured overview uh, and dive into the work that you did, both the impact it had on youth, the remarkable pieces they created and the really uh, careful uh, theoretical underpinnings that you've explored with us. But I do wanna leave some time for folks to ask some questions and uh, open the floor a little bit. Um, but thank you, Elida, for that. that Thank you for listening and yeah, I appreciate it. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so we have a bunch of questions in the chat, um, which, is, which is just wonderful. Um, and if you're one of the question askers, um, uh, you're more than welcome to ask the question verbally and, and add to it if you so choose, um, or I'm happy to, uh, to read it. Um, and, and, uh, and ask it to our, our presenters. Um, uh, Bird, um, whoever Bird is, my, uh, it was asked the first question. So uh, Bird, do you wanna ask your question verbally or do you want, to, want me to ask it? Okay, I'm gonna take that silence as I'm gonna ask it then. Um, uh, so, uh, no, actually, uh, <laughs> I, oh, there you are. Okay. Hi, Amy Guggenheim. I accidentally got on my son's remote <laughs> panel to, and he likes the name Bird. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, you talked about this in some ways, but I was just interested in the kind of uh, exercises that guided the students to choose their sound subjects and, 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 you, and you talked about the awareness they gained from um, dealing with sound, um, and what was the impact of hearing their sounds back to them? But particularly, what are the exercises that guided um, them to choose their sound subjects? How did they find what those subjects were important, meaningful to them? Mm -hmm, sure. So um, at the very beginning of the um, first unit, we explored ways of um, listening practices, I want to say. And I actually want to go back to the website and show you exactly what we did. And I'm hoping that could help. Um, so in this practice, and this was actually also part of my own teacher and researcher role, I had to also create soundscapes, sound recordings as well, um, to be a participant observer with students. So I collected, they did listen as a second activity, listening activity, they listened to these sounds here just randomly. And I didn't give them any information about what these sounds are. Um, I didn't put any uh, indicators or names. Uh, I only asked them to just jump into this little sound pool, sound orchestra. And I asked them to take notes of what they hear what they think. I asked them to take notes of um, the sounds in terms of what they think of the sound textures are, what do they feel, what sounds they feel more attracted to. Um, so to just, I can copy and paste this link in the chat. That's one thing I wanna do so you can all have access to it. Um, but I'm also gonna play a couple of sounds, what they look like what they sound like. So that's one. Okay. 
gives a sense um, the sound orchestra included multiple types of sounds from human sounds to non-human sounds from machine sounds to um, our daily from our daily sound experiences sounds from the street um, I used um, sounds of church bells to prayer calls from a mosque sounds of the protests um, soundscape of uh, cities soundscape of parts. Um, and this did help them to think about what sound marks are. When we think of this, this idea of how sound marks make the soundscapes and create the sounds of a place. Um, so this was uh, part of the first um, activity. Um, I hope that answers the first question and I can see the other questions coming in. So they, um, so the, how did students collaborate with projects in terms of sound artists? We did look at sound artists as well. And for example, in a, another activity, um, well, one of the artists we, artists work we looked at was Murray Schaefer's work. He, in this piece that, uh, he has, he talks about um, he's inviting the viewer to another listening activity, but basically listening in silence, but how silence is a form of another sound. And when you're listening in silence, you're still hearing. It's not that you are here in silence, but um, along with that, we did look at another sound artist, Christine Soon Kim, who is deaf and mute from birth. And she is changing the ways that we hear and listen. So for her, um, listening and hearing the sounds happen in a very different way, in a visual form. He creates um, drawing marks as a language to communicate with her world. Um, hopefully that answers the other questions about like how they collaborated. Um, I am reading Daniel's question. Yes, so in terms of collaboration between students, that's what I'm, I guess, um, hearing. The collaboration happened, to me, the collaboration still was happening. The collaboration happened every time they shared their work with each other. So the entire time they did talk about what sounds they're hearing, they talked about uh, what they're going to record, they talked about their favorite ideas with each other. So they also, were inspired and they were learning from each other. Um, what kind of performance of the work happened in their context? What was the response? Um, performance in the sense of how they created these pieces. That's, is that what you were asking, Bert? Um, and if that's correct, they, their performance was completely virtual, technical, um, they used Audacity, um, sometimes GarageBand. I have two students who had Logic Pro that um, other students did not have access to. So the way that they performed this was in front of a computer and then they worked on layering, downloading, uploading the sounds they recorded constantly from their um, smartphones. Um, I have someone um, that says 
a 21 year old student making sound artwork and found this event. While still researching, I've been using SoundCloud, so it's been great to see what others have been doing with this. Thank you. Thank you for your notes, uh, Tilda. I'm hoping to see, I, I want to catch up with everything. Um, so John Otis said, um, explore, he explored sound and space this semester culminating in museum sound that was presented last week. Sound Diaries, this is great. So students also in this project used sound journals. I actually didn't name them because in research and <laughs> When we do research, um, diaries can become very critical. And, um, but I created them in the form of a journal. So I didn't ask them to take notes of their sounds of places every day, but I asked them to create a sound journal. And whenever they felt like they did write, um, they created a sound journal, basically. This is great. And I would love to join this. This looks great. Uh, what's the difference between being a sound artist and being a musician? Uh, this is a great question, Allison. Um, so the way, um, yeah, we can talk about that, right, all the time. So students used music in their sound art pieces. I don't think Allison is here anymore, but um, students did use music in their sound art pieces. So sound Sound art has this platform. It allows you to bring the visual and music together. That's how I would describe it. Um, and I think this is all. If there's, I think there are more coming <laughs> questions. Daniel, I am uh, having a hard time to catch up here. No, I think you're doing great. Um, we could take, you know, maybe one more question if sure. someone has one. I know I wanted to know what the vegetable was. Oh, that was a cucumber. <laughs> oh, I yeah. thought it was celery. <laughs> yeah, so um, someone said, do you have plans to expand this program to demographics beyond K-12? to It would be lovely to see how different age groups or community different creations. Uh, we actually, Daniel and I, we talked about this yesterday. Uh, it would be great to see this um, in other settings. Yes, um, definitely. Uh, this time, maybe the um, it would be really interesting to see the knowledge that sound brought, maybe in a more visual form. Um, thank you, Rhonda, for your comment. I don't think these people are here anymore, but yeah, think, um, yeah we could probably wrap it up. But this was such a fantastic presentation. What a great final talk of the semester. We really, really appreciate you both. Um, thank you again for. Um, making this happen. I'm sorry, we kind of ran out of time, I think, but yeah, so. Rachel, thank you so much to you and to Allison for providing us with this platform and to Pratt for uh, creating the space for these kinds of collaborations, this kind of research. And uh, when I, at the end of the day, I asked Elida three questions. How is this good for art? How is this good for her as a pedagogue? And ultimately, how is this good for kids? And I think it was a remarkable experience for the youth that wouldn't have happened if Pratt didn't have the, the interest and the, the, the open arms to bring on this kind of research and then give us this opportunity to share. So thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Allison. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Yes, thank you to you all for making this happen, really. Uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. It's been huge, yeah. All right, well, thank you all, and we'll talk soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody.